Greetings, Penta Penguins and Ripperoos. This is Mad Hair Patrick. Multiverses have been a thing nowadays. From Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse or any other Kingdom Hearts video game, for a bunch of universes that just pretty much separate from each other, they seem to be building bridges. And one franchise in particular has made his own multiverse and is actually Crash. Crash Bandicoot, along with Spyro the Dragon, was one of the many video game franchises I have ever played during their time. And like any other gamer, I bought the remastered game and had a blast with them. After the success of the remake games, Activision felt like they were ready to create an original Crash Bandicoot video game. While it is considered the fourth game of the revival series, it's not based off the fourth game of the franchise. In 2001, there was an official fourth Crash Bandicoot game called The Wrath of Cortex. However, unlike the previous three, the game was mixed since Naughty Dog, the creator of the franchise, didn't reprise their development and Sony hired Traveler's Tales instead, resulting in recycled game elements and lackluster innovation. So instead, Activision teams up with Toys for Bob, saying if they're going to make a Crash Bandicoot 4, let's do it right! Welcome to another episode of The Wonder Reviews. Let's see if our favorite marsupial can spin back into action. This is Crash Bandicoot 4! It's about time. Taking place after the events from the third game, Entrophy and Cortex use Uka Uka's magic to create a portal to escape their time prison, but they discover that the Rift can take them to any dimension in the multiverse as they want, and they decide to conquer them. But in order to stop their evil plans, Crash and Coco, along with their old friends and acquaintances, must collect these ancient quantum masks to stop Cortex and Trophy from taking over the multiverse. One thing for sure, this is definitely not the Rapid Cortex, but I am extremely satisfied that there's some innovation and originality into this fourth game. The game as a whole feels like a combination of all the main three games, and I mean it in the best way. You have the first game by where the goal is to simply clear a level to move on to the next stage. It has an advanced difficulty from the second game, which we will get back to it later, and captures the theme of the third game, Space and Time. Since the content of the fourth game is on the multiverse, it spreads the imagination in each level and character they come across. And to be fair, the humor in the fourth game is pretty funny because most of it is pretty meta. How many times have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> funny. Seemed like more. While Crash and Coco stay true to their respective gameplay, there are three additional characters you get to play as. There's Tana, Crash's old girlfriend, who looks like a Mad Max character, and he's from another dimension where her friends are not around. It's pretty cool that she's now an action lady, and I do remember she did kick butt in the first game's as remake. She has the same moves as Crash and Coco, but she has this grappling hook to help her to reach far distances. Next is Dingledale, one of the main villains from the game who now runs a diner place and is trying to return home by spinning his tail and sucking enemies and TNTs with his vacuum gum and fire at them. And finally, you have Cortex, which he has a ray gun that can turn any enemy into a solid or bouncy platform. When it comes to the visuals in the game, they successfully make each of them self-contained in their respective dimensions. Rather, if it's a desert wasteland, a dojo, a pirate cove, a utopian future, or even Cortex's castle from the past. My personal favorite level is off beat for its upbeat music and having a Mardi Gras flair to it with all its vibrant colors. And I definitely want to go to that place. Another thing I like is with the bonus levels for the additional playable characters. If you complete their stage in the level, it will explain what has been helping Crash and Coco to move forward into their respective levels, much like a butterfly effect. Of course, there's the side objective where you have to collect gems to complete the entire game. However, instead of getting one or two gems from each level, you have to collect six of them. You need to collect 40, 60, and 80% of Wumpa fruits, match every crate in the level, find a hidden gem, and try not to die in less than three times to earn a gem. Collecting all of them will reward you with a costume for Crash and Coco if you like to customize them. But it doesn't stop there, there's actually an inverted mode for each level. It's the same level as before, except everything is flipped around a bit with a different canvas, like an actual inverted level or a blue grid. Plus, the gems are flipped upside down and the Wumpa fruits are replaced with graves, and you still have to do the chime trials to earn some relics. Since the goal of the game is to collect masks, there are four of them that aid you on your quest. Now, I don't mean Aku Aku's health and crazy mode because that always happens in the other games. I'm talking about the Quantum Mask. 
One can face objects in and out of existence. Another one can spin non-stop and deflect green blasts. Another one can pause time for a few seconds. And the last one can let you walk up ceilings. The boss battles are fun to face because these are the most recognizable villains in the series like Engine, Cortex, Brio, and Ant Trophy, who actually teamed up with a female Ant Trophy. That's pretty unique. In addition, if you find a VHS in a level without dying, you unlock a bonus level of Crash and Coco's training when they were a lab experiment for Cortex before they escaped to become the mad scientist enemy and the heroes of the franchise. With some of these old mechanics and gameplay from the first three games but also adding some new ones exclusively for It's About Time, the video game does succeed at its own original sequel. However, even though I love this video game, there are still some issues that takes us away from being perfect, and it fully embraces one gamer's weakness. Tortilla chips and sugary drinks. No! The compulsive need to complete every game to 100%. My only criticism in the fourth game is that it's really hard to collect all the gems in the game since you have to smash every crate from every level. The new crates like the fire ones are okay. There's this part of me that wants to complete the entire game like I did with the main three to get that secret ending like most video games do. But the difficulty is much higher than Crash Bandicoot 2 where the crates are either too high to reach a distance, hidden off screen, or somewhere near certain doom like a bunch of enemies, lasers, or any other obstacles standing in your way. Here's my theory. I think the developers wanted to capture the enjoyment of the other Crash games, which is to see Crash die cartoonishly, which was one of the major highlights of the series, similar to Jerk from the Dragon Slayer games. While we do want to reach that 100% completion, it is entertaining to see how he and his friend react on losing. Also, I will admit I didn't like using the Mask of Gravity because it gets confusing to walk upside down and you have to time it right to jump to a safe platform, especially if one is right side up from where you're at with a deadly laser or a hazardous cliff. I'm not saying it's impossible to complete the entire game, you have to be an expert level gamer and have a strong memory to complete everything in every level. The difficulty, much like the Crash Bandicoot Game Overs, is what made Crash Bandicoot a recognizable video game franchise. And I still like it. Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time to know exactly how to make a Crash Bandicoot 4 video game. Yes, the difficulty is trickier than the others, but it does capture the spirit of the series with some fun gameplay, imaginative levels, likable characters, and a unique concept on the multiverse. I definitely recommend you go try this game out. It's refreshing to see a familiar property creating some originality, and it does give hope that the future games based off remakes like Spyro could end up making their own original sequels. I give the official fourth game a B+. Now keep in mind, even though It's About Time is an official continuation to the main three games, it won't wipe away the original fourth game of the Rabbit Cortex completely. People will still look back on it and remember it was a thing and it was a bit of a mistake to the franchise. But like some mistakes, we can still learn from them. And with It's About Time, I think we did. I'm Matt Hara Patrick. Now if you'll excuse me, there's this one dimension I like to go to this year. And trust me, we definitely need it. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe me for a new review and other project every week. I'll see you soon.